welcome, friends, to Beyond the Crucible, the podcast that dares to talk about setback and failure, but not so we can commiserate. It's so we can elevate. I'm Gary Schneeberger, the co-host of the show, and our mission today is to offer you the hope that your crucible experiences, those tragedies and challenges you faced or are facing right now, don't define you. They refine you. They did not happen to you. They happened for you. And um, I don't know many people, if any, who know that truth, those truths better than the founder of Beyond the Crucible, the host of this program, and my friend, Warwick Fairfax. Warwick, uh, once again, we're walking folks through um, a process to help them go from, from tragedy to triumph as we uh, get into our Crucible Hack series, episode five, this is. And uh, I, I dare I say, I think we've got some good t uh, hacks and some good tips for them this week as well. Absolutely, Gary. I'm very much looking forward to this. So as you heard me say, listener, we are indeed on, <clears throat> on episode five of our special summer series, Crucible Hacks. Just a reminder, um, and if you haven't heard the first four episodes, we encourage you, listen to them. We keep them all archived at beyondthecrucible.com, easy to find, um, and you can catch up. So you're not going to be behind. If you just happen to be pumping into this going, oh no, I haven't listened to the first four, you can go listen to the first four, and this one will be there um, after you've done that. But the idea behind here is that we're spotlighting the best practices you can take at each step of the journey from your tragedy to your triumph. Moving beyond a crucible is not easy, it's not usually quick, and it's not something you can accomplish by taking shortcuts. So please don't hear hack, crucible hacks, as shortcuts. They're not shortcuts. The hacks we're talking about aren't quick fixes, they're more ideas and inspiration to help you move from this happened to me, my crucible happened to me, to my crucible happened for me. How are we doing it? We're doing it by taking 10 weeks going step by step through what we call the Beyond the Crucible refining process. Our goal is to give you a helping hand through insights and exercises we have not shared on the regular podcast in the past that will give you helpful guidance on how to tackle and move through each step. And here's the fun part. This is good. We're going to mix things up before we even get into any of that. If you have listened to previous episodes, you know that we have a game that we're playing throughout this entire summer series. Um, it's, it's the uh, Crucible Hacks worksheet. And each week I give you a keyword to, to, to put in your worksheet, and then it, you will solve the, 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 the puzzle at the end of the last episode, and then you mail those in or not mail those in, good grief, the 1960s called, they want their era back. You send those to us, and the um, the t first 25 individuals who complete and submit the worksheet will be rewarded with, check this out, this is a big reward, Warwick's book, Crucible Leadership, autographed by Warwick. So finish the worksheet, it's for free at beyondthecrucible.com, I'm going to give you the word right now that you'll put in for this week, week five. And that word is gifts. See that, 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 that pregnant pause I gave you there, that, that, that dramatic pause? The word is gifts. This week's word is gifts. And why is this week's word gifts? Because what we're talking about this week is talents. And talents is another way to say gifts. Um, Knowing what you're good at and what you're not good at, just as importantly, we'll talk in detail about that too, is a critical step to moving beyond your crucible. In the last few weeks, we've had you go through what you think and what you feel, and now we're going to explore what you do. So you see how they fit together? What you think connects to what you feel, what you feel now. This week, we're going to talk about your talents, and those are the things that you do. Uh so, Warwick, we've talked in the last couple episodes, first about beliefs and values, and then last week about passion. Why is it important now to focus on talents, which, by the way, our friend Noah Webster defined in his first dictionary in 1828 like this? I love this. I say this every week. I love, I love Noah Webster's definitions, but he defined it, he defined gifts, talents as eminent abilities and superior genius. 
What's your reaction to why is this so important for us to talk about now after what we've visited so far? Well, Gary, I love Noah Webster's definition, eminent and abilities and superior genius. I mean, can you can imagine being at a, I don't know, a coffee with a buddy saying, hey, what's your eminent ability? And I don't know about you, but what's your right. superior genius? It's like, <laughs> right. it's a different time. But I think we actually have them, funnily enough. But yeah, just uh, in the context you provided, in the Crucible Hacks Summer Series, we started off talking about, um, obviously, the end goal significance. But the first step was being refined. What are the lessons you can learn from your crucibles? Uh, we've hopefully done some degree of soul work into our beliefs and values. We've got some idea of what we're off the charts passionate about. <clears throat> but, uh, you know, when we explore a vision that will lead to a life of significance, we've got to know our talents, how we're wired. Now, it may seem obvious. Well, of course, you got to know how you're wired. That right. may seem obvious, but life, unfortunately, gets in the way of the obvious. So, for instance, we might have opportunities from friends and families uh, that might be tough to say no to. Hey, I can get you in. I got an in with this guy. Or, you know, it's a safe career choice. It's a steady job. And that's not wrong. But to pursue an opportunity that's out of line with your wiring, that's just not smart. The chances of failure, even at that quote unquote safe job, is high. After all, people pay you to do a good job, not a bad right. job. You can get an in, but you can get an out too. It's called like a pink slip. So, you know, if you go in against your wiring, that's, da that's dangerous. So, um, we need to really understand what our wiring, what our talents are, and pursue opportunities uh, in, in light of that. I mean, if we have eminent abilities and superior genius, but we're pursuing an opportunity that uses none of them, and maybe our, you know, eminent uh, lack of ability and our superior ability to fail or whatever. <laughs> right. That's not what Noah Webster's getting at. Okay, that's the right. anti-definition. That's that's not smart. Right, and it's and it's not true. We hear this a lot, and it's and, and I get the sentiment behind it. We hear this from our parents have told us this, friends have told us this. You can do anything you want. You can do, you know, and and, and that's true to an extent, provided it fits with your your talents. Uh, I mean, I cannot, someone, my mom told me, my dad told me I could do anything I wanted, but uh, being uh, an engineer, I was never going to be able to do because I'm not any good at math and I'm not any good at all the things that I don't even, I can't even tell you all the things that engineers do because that's how not good I would be at that. So it is true. We have to operate in that patch of grass um, where we have those gifts the code word for the worksheet and talents, what we're calling this episode. We have to play there in that sandbox or it's just not going to work out well for us. And that's the reason why we're spending this time, listener, going through how do you discover what your talents are? How do you, and then how do you leverage those things as you march out your life to significance? So uh, work, let's get into the hacks here. We've got a couple of them uh, this week. Uh, the first one uh, we're calling look to the past to forge the future. Okay, that's look to the past to forge the future. And here's the idea behind that. We've talked in an earlier episode about the great insights we can mine from our younger days. Here's a good exercise in that vein. And as we've said for most of the crucible hacks, if you've, if you've been paying attention, and I know you have, um, we've said this a lot, don't overthink it when we pose this exercise, this question to you. Go with the first memories that pop up in your head. Then you'll have time later to unpack those thoughts uh, and, and, and understand why they rose to the surface. So, so here we go. Here's uh, the first hack. Look to the past to forge the future. Identify two or three examples from your life where there was something you were both good at and really enjoyed. Okay, you were both good at it and you really enjoyed it. Your your um, your your passions and your and your gifts were aligned. They were they they were they were stacked together. Look at something like that, and it could be as simple, really, as running a lemonade stand when you were a kid. It could be anything. Look at those things and then start to write those word. You know, start to write those experiences down so that you can keep them in your 
Crucible Hacks workbook. Write those things down as they come to you. Let the information, let the memories, let the, the impressions that you get flow. Why is that exercise so powerful, Warwick, for, for folks to go through? What can they discover about their talents while they go through this exercise? Yeah, you know, Gary, I first came across um, across this uh, a number of years ago. Um, this whole concept of looking at what are the things we're good at and why do we enjoy it. Often our lives are best understood in hindsight by looking back at the at times when we were in elementary school, middle school, high school, maybe twenties, thirties, depending on how old you are. Just different examples. And I first came across this from a work done by. Arthur Miller and Ralph Madsen, they produced a book, gosh, probably more than 30 years ago, called The Truth About You. Mm. And that then uh, led, I think, Arthur Miller in particular, uh, and Ralph Madsen did some work called the Derma Network, and that's morphed into something called the SEMA Map. And basically, that's a bunch of PhDs that ask you these questions, uh, you know, for a price, um, uh, about different examples throughout your life, things you were good at and things you enjoyed. And I come up with this whole SEMA motiv motivated abilities map. And I looked at that and it was just so accurate. So obviously that's very involved. Um, and you know, there's some degree of expense uh, in doing that. But uh, that being said, I think for us, just looking back at your life with those simple questions, what are some examples of what I was good at and things that I enjoyed? Um, I think I'm a great believer in assessments don't define you, but they give right. you a glimpse of who you are. So in the second Act Significance series, we mentioned uh, three assessments that we believe can be helpful, the Enneagram, StrengthsFinder, and Myers-Briggs. Uh, I don't, you know, there are aspects of assessments that I think, well, that's really me, that maybe is not me, but you know, it does give you some degree of, of, of uh, a picture. You take like two or three of those. I think you'll find ones that really resonate. You say, yeah, this this really is me. This really captures right. me. So I'm a great believer in um, I don't trust everything an assessment says because it's looking at it from a t certain angle. But um, I think they can, in context, definitely be helpful, along with this whole concept of what are looking at areas in our life that we're good at and, and, and examples that we really enjoyed. Yeah, and it, it, it's interesting. I was uh, I was telling you when we were uh, uh, planning this that Patrick Lencioni has a new one out, and I forgot the name of it. But given Webster's definition of superior genius being what talent is, here's the book that Lencioni did, The Six Types <laughs> of Working Genius, right? He's, yeah. So this is 2023. That was that was uh, uh, Webster in 1828, um, and, and both of them land somewhere in this idea of genius being what it is um, that we do well. I'm going to ask you a question, Warwick. Um, after I ask myself one, I'm going to go through the exercise first and I'm going to ask you to go through it. But this idea of, of you know, what identify two or three examples from your life where there was something you were both good at and really enjoyed. The first thing that came into my head when I wrote that down on this prep sheet that we were going to then go through was, and it, it always sounds somewhat egotistical to say, leadership. But uh, I was drawn from a very young age from from schoolyard baseball games. There's a there's a thing. I don't know if it's the same uh, in in Australia, but there's a thing in the U.S. At least there was when I was growing up, where you know you pick you, you separated sides. Everybody was there, and you picked two captains. I always wanted to be a captain, so that was my first clue that leadership, leading, making choices, decisions for a group, a team, literally in this case, uh, was something that I I enjoyed doing. Um, but then you'd like take a bat and you toss the bat to the other guy and you, and you do this thing up the bat and then whoever's hand got to the top of the bat underneath the knob on the bat, he was the captain who got to pick first. And I always, you know, I tried to figure out, do I do two fingers? How do I, I, I love this pursuit of leadership and I love the idea of building a team. I love the idea of making out a lineup, doing all those things. And I'm talking at like 10, 11 years old. And that has proven to be, as if I look at my life and the positions I've had and the jobs I've held, I've, I've, I've ended up in that. So my, my, my talent for that um, started, 
on a makeshift baseball diamond in a field somewhere, uh, and it's led up to the career I currently have. That's just one example of when I when I thought about this concept of looking back at at my youth to see what it was that I really enjoyed doing and that I felt I was good at, that's what popped to mind. And that's that's what my life of significance looks like today. How would you answer that question? Can you think of an example that where you found something where you discovered that you were good at it from a yeah. younger day? Yeah. And I've been thinking about this a bit and, uh, you know, I, I had an example, but then I thought more and I thought back to what were some of the examples I filled out on my SEMA map, you know, to things I'm good at, things I was enjoying. I remember this example that I came up with, which was really an early clue to me being a reflective advisor. It just came to me like uh, last few minutes, funnily enough. Um, (laughs) And uh, I remember, as listeners would know, went to Oxford and went to Harvard Business School. But in between, I worked in a bank on Wall Street. Uh, Chase Manhattan Bank, and they put you through this rigorous, like nine-month training program, and they taught you everything you need to know about accounting and bank lending. And um, at the very end of that uh, program, you had to uh, prepare like three different cases, if you will, three different examples of loans the bank might make, and they just wanted to, you know, check your chops, if you will, and just uh, can you really figure out. Um, how to make a good loan analysis and recommendation. So at the time, I was working some some weekends uh, preparing for this. And uh, I remember uh, I was sitting at my desk and there was a bunch of like interns there. And Chase Manhattan at the time had an internship program for, uh, this is like back in the 80s, for African-American students to um, give them a chance to be an employee at Chase Manhattan Bank. And so for many, I'm sure in the New York area, this was an incredible opportunity. And they were working hard and very motivated. And uh, I guess they knew that I worked in the bank and was studying. And they asked me questions on, I don't know if it was some bank lending thing or accounting. I forget what it was. But um, I've always loved helping people and giving them advice. So one would come over and over the next couple of hours, it felt like five or six came over because the first person said, hey, <laughs> this guy over there is actually helping me. And i am right. always been incredibly motivated to give people advice as well as I feel like I'm very good at explaining things simply, succinctly, steps. Uh, that's, I guess, is part of my ability to be a reflective advisor. I think I advise and explain things well, if not very well. And I'm very motivated to help people, help people accomplish their dreams, whatever that is. This is long before I was an executive coach. But I think back to that example where I was helping people realizing that given the background some of those young people came from, this was important. So if if in some very small way, I could help them give them advice that would lead them to a good job that could change, not to get too over the top the direction of their lives and their families. I mean, I, I even at a young age, I realized what was happening here, and I, I wanted to do my level best to help. So maybe that's an early example of my passion to be a reflective advisor and to just to help people. And that, right, those are the seeds of your superior genius, to use Noah Webster's term. Those, those were seeds. And uh, it, what I love about this, it's also an example, listener, of, I mean, Warwick just lived it out right here on the show. When, when we say don't overthink it when you go through these exercises, don't overthink it. Don't, don't, you won't have to. Warwick, Warwick had something completely different prepared to say. <laughs> and then it just in the, in the course of this conversation that we're having right now with you listening in, that came to him. That popped up in his head and he went with it. He didn't overthink it. He didn't say, oh, I don't know. Is that right? He, did, he went with it and it fit perfectly. That's an example. Works has given you an example of how to approach these hacks when it's think about this, imagine that. What did what was life like here? Um, don't overthink it. Go with it. Write it down. And and, and that was a that was a that was indeed um, the start of your eminent ability as a reflective advisor for sure. Um, let's go on to the second hack here in the Crucible Hacks episode five uh, about our talents. And this one's going to be fun, I think. Um, Words matter, we're calling this one. And this one is uh, 
deceptively simple. In other words, it seems really simple, but there's a lot of depth to it as you as you go after it. So grab a piece of paper from your Crucible Hacks notebook that we've been encouraging you to keep and start jotting out the words that pop into your head to complete these sentences. And if you want to write the sentences down, you can keep coming back to them. The first sentence is, I am good at blank. Sentence one. Sentence two is, I'm a good blank. Again, the critical bit of counsel here is do not overthink it. Pretend you're playing the fast money round on Family Feud, right? Steve Harvey's throwing these words at you or these phrases at you, and you're just coming up with words and, and answers to that. Just start listing the words you think of. Don't ask why you thought of them. Uh, that's for later. Just as rapid fire as you can, write down the things experience has shown you you have skills doing. And here's the other fun part. There's a two-step process here. When you've gone through that, when you've done some of that, you don't have to have it completed. It may never be completed. You may keep that notebook and as things pop in your head, write them down. But there's a second step to this. Ask your friends and family the same questions and write down what they say too. Don't talk to them about it as they're answering. Let the information flow. Just let them have the floor and let them, let them answer those questions and keep answering them as things pop into their heads. If they keep come up, you know, if they keep coming up with things you're good at and you're there for 35 minutes or an hour and a half, guess what? That just means you're good at a lot of things. <laughs> That's a good thing. If it takes a little time, it's a good thing. So, Warwick, what's the value that you see in this exercise for our listeners? Yeah, Gary. I mean, sometimes if we just write down a list of words, hey, I'm good at A, B, C, D, E, as you said before, don't overthink it. Uh, Hopefully, we know ourselves well enough that um, we come up with some ideas. Often, the issue is can be not so much we don't know ourselves, we just don't think about that and making decisions as if somehow it's not really relevant to what we do in life. We need to pick the good opportunity rather than ask ourselves the question, is this actually in line with what we're good at? It right. seems kind of obvious, but life is so busy, it's amazing how easy it is not to do the obvious, you know, not to do the thing that you know, it should be clear. So I think that's very helpful. I think the second part of the exercise you outlined, Gary, is very interesting because I think it's often the case that our friends and family who we've grown up with for, you know, decades, if you will, uh, they know us, they, you know, they collectively see who we are, you know, more than we might actually think. And so um, if you collect just kind of, you know, give me a list of six, 10 words that really captures what I'm good at, and you ask a bunch of friends and then, you know, draw those pieces of the jigsaw puzzle together, I think you'd be surprised at how accurate a portrait collectively that your friends and family can bring. I mean, you'll be amazed at how much that they really know you. So, and right. I think they would really enjoy doing that, you know. So, do the exercise. I think you'll be very surprised of how much they really, you know, nailed it and how much they know you. Right. And, and and all the words that you'll be accumulating from yourself and from your loved ones, people who are close to you, colleagues, friends, family, all those words on that sheet of paper that you're writing them down, hopefully sheets of paper that you're writing it down on, all of those uh, become cookie batter that you can bake lots of cookies to help you find your vision, right? Because remember, what we're building to here first is a vision, and that's where beliefs and values and, um, and, and gifts and passions, all those things kind of coalesce there, and that helps inform what your vision for your life post-crucible will be like. So, so think of it that way. Those words are, are lifeblood um, that can help feed into that vision that you're going to be building as you continue to move um, along this road. Warwick, you also had a perspective on this. Um, don't just ask them what you're good at, but sometimes it's just as valuable, maybe even more valuable in some cases, depending on what they say, um, to ask them another question. And that is, what am I not all that good at? What, you know, uh, what, where have you seen me sort of not be good at something? Why is that a helpful sort of cousin to what we've asked them to do first? Yeah, it's a good point, Gary. Um, they'll definitely be able to nail what we're good at. But what might be scary is as much, maybe even more, <laughs> they'll know what we're bad at. Now, sometimes we might think, well, I think I'm okay at this, and I think I'm 
you know, I don't know how really in touch we are, what, what, what we're bad at. Maybe we are, but, you know, our friends and family, all oh, they know us. They know what we hate to do. They know what we're bad at. So, uh, the chances of them collectively being wrong is, I don't know if it's zero, but it's, it's approaching zero. Uh, <laughs> assuming they're honest. And why wouldn't they be honest with their friends and family? Hey, I get to come up with a list of what you're bad at. Imagine it's your younger sibling or something. Right, it's like, they'll be like, cool. yes, let's go. All right, let's go, yeah. <laughs> exactly. I've been waiting to do this. You know, it's like, hit me, please. Sure, yeah. why not? Yeah. Let's go. So, yeah, I think you'd be surprised at how much they really know you. And uh, this is a f funny, it, because I have a note here to, to ask you a question, and I'm going to ask you the question, but then I'm also going to play the exercise out for listeners after I ask you the question. You'll understand what I mean by that when I ask the question. So here's the question. Don't answer yet until I've done, you know, I give what I'm going to say. So the question to you, Warwick, is what would your friends and family say you're not good at? Now, listener, right now you're going to see this, this in, uh, in action, this, this, this exercise happen. Cause let's pretend, let's, pre you know, pretend Warwick just asked me that question. What do you think I'm not good at? Uh, what have you seen me not be all that good at? W not necessarily a s where I don't have superior genius. And I'm going to answer that question for Warwick right now live on the show, which is kind of fun. And I would say, if you ask me that question, Warwick, I would say to you, and, and you'll and you would acknowledge this. This isn't a, this isn't a blind spot for you at all. And that is, you're not a good seller of yourself in particular of the things you produce, those kinds of things. I imagine if you had to sell, you know, uh, something that wasn't attached to you and didn't feel like you were maybe bragging about yourself, it might be a little easier. But those kinds of situations where you have to be promotional is what I would call it as a PR guy. Those, those are situations that that's not, I mean, it feels harsh to say you're not good at it, It's but it, it, it's not definitely one of your eminent abilities, selling yourself, promoting yourself. Gary, that's right on. I mean, there's no question, you know, and I think there are reasons why sometimes understanding the reasons why we're bad at things is actually helpful. Yeah. Uh, one of my highest values is humility. And so I would much rather listen and learn than speak and preach. It's not like I don't have ideas about things in a certain context of being a reflective advisor. I can get passionate about things, but by and large, I don't like telling people what to do with their lives. I don't, so that kind of gets into, because I'm more of a private, maybe more on the introverted end of the spectrum, uh, I don't like selling. Certainly, I don't like selling anything, to be honest, but certainly <laughs> don't like selling uh, what I do because it's like, here, this is the greatest thing since sliced bread. It'll solve your problems. It's like, I don't like imposing myself on people. I get self-conscious. I don't do it smoothly. I do it in a clunky, like, I don't know, uh, sand in the gears kind of way. It's just, you know, it really falls flat because I hate it so much. And it's obvious that I hate selling. And um, yeah, there's something about it that feels like wrong selling. It's like, I think of myself as a used car sales salesman. It's like, I'd rather listen and learn than impose something on others. And here's proof that I don't have that same problem because as a promotional guy, as a PR guy, I will say this about what you just said. Um, and, and maybe that's selling this to the audience. If you listen to what Warwick just said, look at the, all the value that came out of that from how for how he understands his gifts. By understanding what aren't your gifts, it helps point the arrow toward what are your gifts. So I will say, I will argue as someone who doesn't quite have selling in that way as a as a as a, I consider that kind of a, a gift of mine, a talent of mine. Um, listen to what Warwick said there, folks, and and you'll benefit from that as you as you apply it to yourself. If you have that kind of passion, that kind of strong feeling about something that you don't believe you're good at, that just eliminates some of the some of the spectrum of things that you are good at, and that helps you narrow down those directions that you want to pursue. Um, we are now at, uh, as we're ready to close here, uh, we're about halfway through, we are halfway through, this episode will be halfway through, five episodes through 10 of our Crucible Hacks series. And you, listener, may be asking yourself a question that as you've gotten these hacks for the first five episodes, okay, I got a lot of good information, now what do I do with it? 
we have an answer for that. Um, with these hacks, with these this information that you've gathered in this episode and the previous episodes, hang on to that. That's why we've urged you to keep a, a workbook because um, – Warwick and I will help you take what you've learned and put it into practice and apply towards your vision, which will then lead you to a life of significance when we do the wrap up episode of this in about a, a little over a month. So that's episode 10. This is episode five. We're only halfway through, but that's where unpacking this stuff. We've said a lot. Don't overthink this, that, and the other thing. You get a chance to think through them more, more robustly when we get to the final episode, and we give you some tips on how to apply all that you've learned. Um, uh, does that make sense, Warwick? And any final thoughts beyond that that you want to leave folks with? Yeah, I mean, I think it's um, understanding our talents and wiring is so critical. Yes, obviously, you've got to understand your passions, beliefs, and values, uh, learn the lessons of your crucible, but it's just very easy in life not to be reflective. Now, obviously, one of my strengths, as listeners know, is being reflective, being a reflective advisor. But most people are in the hustle and bustle of life, whether it's you know young kids, college, uh, working away through the world and in your career or you know whatever stage in life you're at. And life goes by so quickly that it's just hard to find time to think. And so too often people will say, this is great opportunity. You know, it's a can't miss business or it's a great career. It's a safe job. Maybe mom and dad kind of have it in there or, you know, family friend. So it's easy to say, well, gosh, you know, how can I not say yes to this opportunity? But if it's not in line with your talents and wiring, the chances that you'll succeed in this are low. And then if it's something your friends and family have gotten you into, not only will you let yourself down, you probably let them down. I mean, who wants to let down a bunch of people? So, uh, you know, it's really, um, you work in an area where you're not gifted in, it's soul destroying. Bit mm -hmm. by bit, it just, you know, destroys the joy, if you will, uh, when you work in a job that's out of line with your gifts. You know, it's not a great opportunity. It, it's fool's gold, so to speak. It may be shiny, but you know, um, it's just, it makes no sense. So, um, and we talk about the end goal in the first episode is to lead a life of significance. The chance of you finding your life of significance in a job or a business that's not in line with your talents and wiring, it's low as to be almost zero. So you want to lead a life of joy and fulfillment. You better make sure that what you're doing is in line with your um, your gifts, your talents, and your wiring. I mean, you just have to be there. Did you hear that, listener? That was the host of the show, Warwick Fairfax, exercising his superior genius as a reflective advisor. And with that, we're going to drop the plane on the ground, and I'm going to say, come back next week and join us when we offer up more crucible hacks to help you achieve a life of significance. If you enjoyed this episode, learned something from it, we invite you to engage more deeply with those of us at Beyond the Crucible. Visit our website, beyondthecrucible.com, to explore a plethora of offerings to help you transform what's been broken into breakthrough. A great place to start? Our free online assessment, which will help you pinpoint where you are on your journey beyond your crucible and to chart a course forward. See you next week. Thank you.